Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today we are once again talking about LumaCode but this time LumaCode with the OSSC. If you're unaware of LumaCode it is basically a format created by certain digitizers which are installed in your target system and they create a quasi-digital video format known as LumaCode which is then decoded by up until recently the RGB to HDMI. Once decoded, this provides a pixel-perfect digital video output from systems like the Commodore 64 and the 128, uh, I think the VIC-20, a bunch of Atari systems, even the ColecoVision, and most recently the NES. Now up until recently, LumaCode was only supported by the RGB to HDMI, and unfortunately this thing does not handle audio. So in order to get audio into the HDMI signal, you need something like the HDMI audio embedder that I have here. Now personally for me this hasn't been a huge deal because I usually run audio directly to my amplifier rather than relying on the internal TV speakers which are generally pretty shit. However I've always made a point of bringing up the audio issue because a lot of people will be relying on audio to be in that HDMI signal. Really the only time I ever need to use something like this is when I'm making a YouTube video because it's just easier to capture the audio and video straight over a single HDMI connection. So while the RGB to HDMI is really good at what it does, and it's not just for LumaCode stuff, uh, unfortunately there's no audio support at the present moment. So that's where the OSSC comes in. I'm sure most people watching are already aware of the OSSC, and you may even have one yourself. And as of firmware version 1.10, which was released just a couple of days ago, this now supports LumaCode. At the moment it's only the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum and the TMS based systems like the ColecoVision that have LumaCode support on the OSSC, but it's a start. Now the reason this is exciting is because the OSSC can directly take a LumaCode signal and it can also take an audio signal and give you everything over the HDMI connection. Basically what the job of these two things are doing but in one single unit. Now there are a couple of prerequisites with the OSSC. First of all, you need one that has the HDMI output. I think the oldest ones have only DVI output and that is obviously not gonna carry audio. The second thing you need is for your OSSC to support the current firmware version. Now for boards that are labeled version 1.8 and beyond, that's not a problem. You can just update to the latest firmware. But if you've got an older OSSC like this one here, which I believe has a revision 1.7 board, you need to do a small hardware mod before you can update to the latest firmware. If you're not sure what board revision you have, you can always take the covers off this thing and take a look. Or an easy way is just to plug this in and power it on. Once you power it on, it will briefly display the firmware version. In this case, it's 0.90A. Anything below 1.0 means you've got an older board and it will require a modification. And anything above 1.0 means you've got a newer board and you can just update straight to the latest firmware. I deliberately picked up an OSSC with an older board revision so I could go through how to do this little hardware mod. And speaking of boards, I'd like to thank our channel sponsor, PCBWay. Yes, you can get high quality boards made by PCBWay for $5 for 10 pieces. They can also populate those boards with their PCB assembly service, and they do high quality CNC machining and 3D printing and a whole lot more. So thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video. So let's take the covers off this thing and I'll show you how it's done. All we need to do is remove these four screws on top. And with those four screws out of the way, you can remove the top cover, and then you just need to unscrew these plastic standoffs. With that done, you can remove the next cover, and that'll give you access to the circuit board. And as you can see, my board revision is a 1.7. So to perform this mod, we need a small length of wire. I think this is 28 gauge. And a soldering iron with a fairly fine tip, because we do need to remove one of these resistors up the front here, and basically put a bodge wire between there and one of the legs on this IC under this heatsink. I'd also recommend some external flux, in this case I've got a No Clean Liquid Flux by MG Chemicals. So let's start by removing R35, which is this one here next to these two LEDs. So I'm just going to put a little bit of No Clean Flux on there, just to get things flowing easily. And with the soldering iron, being careful not to touch the components around it. I'm just going to attempt to heat up both ends of this resistor. All right, it's coming. There it goes. And that's our resistor removed. There's no reason to keep that. I'm just going to come back in with a little bit of fresh solder just to prep those pads where the resistor was. Just like that. What we need to do now is solder a wire to the pad from the resistor that we just moved that is closest to this DC barrel jack. So it's going to be this pad here. Just going to prep the end of my wire. 
Throw on another splash of No Clean Flux. Try and get everything lined up and then just a quick touch with the soldering iron. Of course you'll want to make sure that your join is good so feel free to give that wire a bit of a jiggle. Now we just need to attach the other end of the wire to the corner pin of this chip under the heatsink here. It's this pin just here. There's no need to actually lift that pin off. We just need to solder this wire to it. Of course I lucked out and got a board where the heatsink is just a little bit crooked and it's kind of blocking access to that pin. Uh, I should still be able to do this without removing that heatsink but you might not be able to see it all too well. So I've just shortened that wire and I'm just going to strip a tiny little bit off the end here. That'll do, you don't want to expose too much of this wire. Put a little bit of fresh solder on that. And of course a little bit of fresh solder on this pin, which is a bit tricky to get to. And unfortunately you're not going to be able to see much of this, but I'll show you the end result. So if you've done it correctly, you should now have that wire connected to that very corner pin right there, and you can give it a little jiggle just to make sure it's not going anywhere. And that should be it. We can now update this to the latest firmware version, which obviously has LumaCode support, but it also includes a bunch of other features that are not found on the pre 1.0 firmwares. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, I'll link a video up there to control old Reese's channel where he recently did this same upgrade. All right, we're all back together. Now we just need a little micro SD card to load our firmware update file onto. So on the computer, we want to head over to junkerhq.net and find the OSSC page and then scroll down to where it says firmware, which is somewhere around here, number 10, and find the firmware images for version 1.xx. And as you can see, the latest firmware version is 1.10, so we just want to download that bin file. We also need another program to write that firmware to our SD card. It's not as simple as just copying the bin file over. Uh, here they recommend Etcher software, but because I'm on a Windows machine, I use the Win32 disk imager. Again, I'll leave links to all this in the video description. So let's just download that. And once you've got that installed, be sure to plug in your SD card reader and open up Win32 disk imager. And you should see something like this, just make sure that the device selected is correct because this will completely wipe everything on your SD card. Then we just want to point it towards the image file. Now for this program it defaults to looking at .img files and we've got a .bin file so we just need to change this to look at all files and we should find OSSC 1.10. And with that loaded in we just hit write. This will only take like less than a second, it's already done. With that complete, we can remove our micro SD card and stick it in the SD card slot on the OSSC. So it goes in with the contacts facing up. Now I'm going to hook up a HDMI cable. You don't necessarily have to hook this up to a display, but it just makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on rather than trying to do it off this little screen here. So everything should still look the same as it was before. We just need to go into the menu and go into settings. Oh, and keep in mind this will erase your current profiles, so you may want to back them up if you haven't done so already. Uh, head over to Firmware Update, it'll quickly validate the file, and then we just want to hit 1 to update the firmware. And a few seconds later you'll see Firmware Updated, please restart on the front display, so we just need to switch it off, switch it back on again, and we should see the current firmware version. You can now remove the micro SD card, or you can just leave it in if you prefer. And now we're ready to test this thing out with LumaCode support. All right, so I've got my trusty Commodore 64 ZIF machine here, which already has our VIC-2 digitizer installed, and that is running to my RF replacement board. Uh, that's just an easy way to get to LumaCode on this 3.5mm output jack. Unless you have my RF replacement board, you're probably going to have LumaCode hooked up to the RF output jack. Either way, it's going to work. So with my RF replacement we can use the 3.5mm jack here and just set the switch to an external input and hook LumaCode up to these pin headers. That will give us audio on the left channel and our LumaCode signal on the right channel. So for LumaCode we just plug that into the green jack and audio can be plugged into this 3.5mm jack which means of course I need an adapter to go back to 3.5mm. That's fine, it can go in either one because the OSSC can downmix this to mono. You also need to make sure that this little switch hiding in here is set to the leftmost position. Uh, that's the audio input. 
If that switch is set to the rightmost position, then this becomes an audio output. So with everything plugged in, we just need to power on the OSSC and obviously power on our Commodore 64. As I mentioned, there's also support on the OSSC for the ZX Spectrum and the TMS-based systems, but I only have the Commodore 64 and the Commodore 128 to test at the moment. And we just power on the OSSC and go to AV2YPBPR. And you should get something that looks like this. We just need to change a couple of settings on the OSSC to make this look correct. So in the menu, just head down to output options and change the 240p, 288p to line 5x mode. And then head down to line 5x mode and change this to 384 by 240 optimal. Finally, to get that aspect ratio correct, I recommend going for 1920 by 1200. That seems to give the most accurate aspect ratio. Of course, it still looks a bit funky, but we need to do a couple more things. Head up to video in processing and you'll see a LumaCode option at the bottom. We just need to set that to C64, which makes it look even more funky. And finally, head into the sampling options, into advanced timing, and change the horizontal sample rate to 504 for PAL systems. And for NTSC systems, it's either 512 or 520, depending on the VIC-2 version. I actually did some beta testing with LumaCode support on the OSSC, and I couldn't test out NTSC Commodore 64s. So it should be either 512 or 520, one of those should work. But as you can see, we're getting close. The last thing to do is just adjust the sampling phase until the colors look correct. So I found zero degrees usually works well, but you can always go one step either side if it doesn't look quite right. In this case, 348 seems to look better, but we're still getting some glitching in there. But that could be down to this cheap ass cable that I'm using. It might be picking up a little bit of interference. So we can correct for that, hopefully. Let's go back and head back to video in processing and just boost up the GY offset a little bit. There we go. And there we have it. So let's test out the sound, make sure that is also working. So I've just thrown in the Easy Flash 3 cartridge and, ooh, and those colors don't look right. Like I said, I did some beta testing and originally the color palette that Marcus was using looked, well, kind of like this. And he actually updated it to one that I recommended and that looked a lot better, but it looks like as of the official firmware, uh, you may have gone back to using the previous palette. I'm just gonna quickly swap back to that beta firmware to make sure I'm not going crazy. All right, and back on that previous version, the colors now look correct. Uh, let's have a look at the basic screen. Oh yeah, that looks better. Um, I guess it was just a slight oversight by Marcus with the latest firmware. I'll let him know that it's reverted back to the previous palette and I'm sure he'll fix it when he gets a chance with the small update. Let's test out this audio functionality. Sweet. That seems to work. Uh, we've only got it in one channel though, so just need to head into the menu, go to audio options and change that to mono mode. There we go. So there it is. If you want everything over a single HDMI cable, then it's probably a lot easier than using this along with this. Just for good measure, let's test it out with the Commodore 128. And I think while I do that, I might just make a small change to this cable. Yeah. Oh, not today, Satan. There we go. Quick and dirty, but it'll do the job. Looks like I left the 128 digitizer in the 128D. And uh, obviously this RF board isn't soldered in. Uh, it's just hooked up by these DuPont connectors. Normally I use this machine to actually test my RF replacements before shipping them out. So uh, that's why it's not soldered in, but that's fine. This should work all the same. So plug that in there. And with our slightly modified cable, we can just plug these straight in. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. And I've just realized that I put what I thought was a 3.5 mil jack on there. And I think it's actually a 2.5 mil jack. Why I even have 2.5 mil jacks, I don't know. That's a bit annoying. 
Right, well I found a mono 3.5mm jack, which is perfectly fine because the OSSC will handle the rest. Let's try that again. So, that goes in there, that now goes in there, uh, and we'll power this on, but I totally forgot to save those settings, so I'm going to have to set this back up again. Right, and there we go, a jail bar free 128. Ooh, and there's a bit of noise in the Easy Flash 3 screen. I probably should have shortened that cable while I was at it, but I'm sure we can fix that up. Just boost the offset a little bit. All right, that looks better. In fact, while I'm here, probably should just save that as a profile. Nice. One last thing to look at is lag. Now what you're seeing is the NES with the RGB to HDMI, so this is what I had set up in the previous video, and this is connected to both my CRT display and my plasma display. Now keep in mind the plasma display has a measured lag of around 30 milliseconds, so close to two frames. What we can see with the NES is around two frames of lag, but you've got to keep in mind the plasma itself already introduces two frames of lag, so we're talking about less than a frame of lag with the RGB to HDMI and NES solution. As for the OSSC, we obviously can't test that with the NES just yet, so I've got the C64 hooked up and it is printing out the internal Jiffy clock. Now the Jiffy clock on the C64 runs at 60 frames per second regardless of NTSC or PAL mode, and you'll notice it does skip every second or third number, but that's just down to the C64 and its basic interpreter. But the takeaway here is the CRT is updating around two or three frames before the plasma. And once again, you've got to keep in mind that the plasma already has two frames of lag. So once again, it looks like we're under a frame of lag, but I'm sure we'll get more accurate results in the future as people who have better test equipment can try this out for themselves. So that is it for LumaCode support on the OSSC, at least for the Commodore 64 and 128. As I mentioned, the ZX Spectrum and the TMS-based systems also seem to be supported at the moment, and with any luck we'll get the other systems supported along with the NES. So a big thanks to Marcus for adding initial LumaCode support to the OSSC, and thank you to Mr. Lurch for letting me borrow his OSSC, which is what I used to do the initial beta testing. I then picked up one of these for myself and deliberately chose the older hardware version so I could show how to do that hardware mod. And then Control Alt Reese made a video within that time showing how to do it on his channel. So um, thanks a lot, Reese. Anyway, very cool to see LumaCode support added to this. Uh, hopefully we'll get to see, you know, the rest of these supported like the NES. And who knows, maybe it'll come to the RetroTINK products as well. I guess that's up to Mike Chi. But yeah, at least we've got something other than the RGB to HDMI plus the audio embedder if you need audio in the HDMI signal. I'll get in touch with Marcus about that little color palette issue and I'll put any important updates in a pinned comment on this video. So um, yeah, once again, thanks to Marcus for the OSSC and now LumaCode support. Of course, thanks to Copper Dragon for coming up with LumaCode in the first place. Thank you to Mr. Lurch. Thank you, Reese. Thank you all for watching and a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. Uh, that is it for me. Leave any thoughts or comments down below and I will hopefully catch you in the next one. Bye.